happy Saturday. Uh, I was going to say Saturday afternoon, but for a couple of us on the screen, we might be in other time zones. Um, Saturday-ish. Uh, mm -hmm. This is James Sullivan one more time with the uh, 16th annual first virtual Newburyport Documentary Film Festival. Um, this is, uh, for, in this virtual era, uh, what we're doing today is going to serve as our sort of wrap up party. Um, this is our filmmakers round table. And as I was just mentioning to the filmmakers a few minutes ago, um, what we do in normal times is we have a Saturday afternoon event that we've been doing for the last several years called the filmmakers round table, where we just bring everybody together at the Port Tavern in Newburyport um, and buy each of the filmmakers a drink and mm -hmm. sit around in the upstairs room at the, uh, at the tavern and just talk about the process of filmmaking and let the filmmakers discuss with each other uh, concerns, issues, uh, you know, pro tips, um, financing problems, you know, sort of comparing notes and just otherwise generally talk about the festival and their experience. And um, th so that's what we're gonna do today. Um, and we've found since we started doing the Filmmakers Roundtable that we've had, a re we've had a really good time doing it. And so we're glad to be able to recreate it um, through the you know, magic of Zoom um, here. So thanks for being with us, everybody. Um, I am going to, um, mention a couple of things and then well what i'm going to mention primarily is that stick around for a little while we are going to our judges have determined their winning the, the the films that they want to award so we have those awards in our hands and we are going to reveal them um at, at, a little later in the session so um i'm going to go around real quick and uh, have each of the filmmakers uh, introduce themselves and explain, sort of do your elevator pitch for your film. So that uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, you'll know wh where they're coming from and what their film is. And for those of you who have seen it, but maybe didn't see the Q&A, you'll be, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know um, making the connection between the, uh, who made what, who, who, which filmmakers made what films. So um, I'm gonna go top, to, you know, upper left and around uh, uh, from my view anyway. So uh, if you can just go ahead and introduce yourselves and, and, uh, and, and explain your film. I'm going to start with Patty and Ed. Hi. Hi. So, um, yeah, I'm Ed. This is Patty, my wife. Um, we uh, produced and directed uh, Progress together. And it's a very short film about, really about the history of Soho from the point of view of uh, my experience living there in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. That's Great. And the elevator is at floor three, and we're, we're or floor two now. And so we're going to move over to James Lasore, uh, who is uh, uh, based in Nebraska at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, but right now he's coming to us from South Dakota. Oops, unmute. No. The, uh, the little uh, space bar go. didn't work. The space bar didn't work. <laughs> I tried it. Uh, uh, just, uh, just so you all know. Um, okay, so my name is James Lasser. I'm the director of the Art of Descent. Um, I'm based at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. I'm the chair of the history department at Nebraska, and the Art of Descent is my first film, uh, and my uh, and my kind of entry into the film world, which has been a kind of a exciting, uh, topsy turvy world. It's very different from the world of academia. But there's some similarities too. And, and we basically made the film. We started with my partner, Mariana Chapkova and I in, in Prague. Um, and our group kind of expanded to include a lot of people who basically volunteered to help make the film. We couldn't have done it without a lot of people who just wanted to go to Prague and help film and to be involved in our project to bring the story of dissidents from 1968 through the Velvet Revolution to, uh, to life. Um, and we wanted to make a film that was optimistic, that would show how struggle turned into something positive in a very turbulent time. Uh, and it's been a great experience. I'm really, really proud to be from the University of Nebraska, which, which uh, basically financed the film. Uh, it's also Nebraska's first attempt to make a major film, as far as I know. Um, and we're all having a lot of fun. And I really, it's an honor to be with you. This is a great film festival and it's been fun to kind of interact with you as I've done over the last week or actually month or two. Thank, thank you. 
And you're making another film in South Dakota, so you're sort, you know, you're. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I. This is like the the what weird advantage of the COVID world in filmmaking is. Uh, I'll, although I'd much rather be with you in a pub right now, even if it's a midday drink. Um, <laughs> I I'm also able to work on a film, so I'm here filming in South Dakota. I'm in the Black Hills right now, so I've been filming all week, bouncing around back of trucks, chasing right. bison around, um, and it's you know it allows us to work and and to do this kind of stuff. It's really interesting in that sense. I also think that the this you know the the upside of this is more people can see films that normally right. wouldn't be able to go to festivals, and that's really opened up different audiences. And I think it's been an advantage in a certain sense. And you guys have done such a great job with you know, interacting with the filmmakers and presentations of film. It's just been a real pleasure to be with you. And just so everybody knows, the um, poor tavern thing, um, we wouldn't be doing this at one o'clock when we were handing out drink, drink tickets. <laughs> we do it sort of more later in the afternoon. So it so at least feels legitimately like, you know, it's five o'clock somewhere type of thing. <laughs> well, it is, a, it is the weekend, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I, right, exactly. <laughs> Uh, let's go to Brian Redondo. Uh, hi, Brian. Thanks for being with us. And um, go ahead and uh, you know introduce yourself. Well, I just introduced you, but go ahead and uh, tell us a little, you know about your film. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm Brian Redondo. I'm the director of the short doc Keep Saray Home, uh, which takes a look at uh, Southeast Asian refugee families living in the greater Boston area uh, facing the looming threat of deportation, and sort of how that community has has responded. Right. And uh, serendipitously, the next person I'm going to say hello to uh, it had a film in your same shorts block. Uh, Chris Del Rio, um, hi, and uh, say hello to us. Hi. Yeah, my name is Chris Del Rio. Um, I'm the director and editor of a film, short film called Fort Ismet. Um, I also shot it in Lynn along with Brian. I mean, not together, obviously, but um, yeah, my film is about um, Ismika Janovic, who is related to me via my brother-in-law, um, who passed away from cancer a couple of years ago. And it's basically, he was a Bosnian refugee from the war in the 1990s um, and came here to America with his family. So it's kind of like a memorial to his life. And we go back through, you know, how the war affected them in Bosnia. They lived in Germany for a few years and then eventually settled in America and his family has been here for 20 years now. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then uh, Polly Wells, how are you? Hello. Um, I'm uh, here from Toronto. I'm an American living in Canada. Um, uh, now a dual citizen actually. Um, and I made a film about uh, a couple in uh, Massachusetts, um, in Amherst, Mass, named Annie Patterson and Peter Blood, who became quite well known in certain circles by the songbooks they produced, Rise Up Singing and more recently Rise Again, which Rise Up Singing has sold over a million copies around the world. But they're really about, the film is about their mission, which is they basically devoted their lives to um, reviving the lost habit of communal singing. That is to say, just singing for the sake of singing, not to perform, not to practice, not, not to be a great singer, but simply to use singing as a way to be in community, um, connect with other people in a, in a way that actually builds um, bonds, just almost as a chemical, um, feature of singing in the same room. Um, and uh, they're also social activists. So they've used singing as a way to change people's hearts and minds about each other. Um, and they're protégés of Pete Seeger, um, who basically did that as well and set, set, set the bar high for how to do that and why to do that. And um, I got to film with Pete um, just a year before he died. Um, when they were, because he, he worked with them for 30 years on their, on their projects. So that's my film. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks for bringing it to and us. And also a very hopeful film uh, to go to hopeful. James's yeah. point. Yes. Um, which we need right now, I think. <laughs> right. Uh, we had, you know, probably more than a typical share, uh, not particularly surprising, I don't think, but of either, of either films that were sort of raising the prospect of crisis or, protest mm. or <clears throat> how to 
address the idea of finding hope in a you know time when we could use it. <laughs> um, I'm not particularly surprised that that kind of tended ended up being a bit of a theme this year. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, uh, Leanne, uh, how are you? And uh, uh, thanks for being with us. Thanks. Thanks. I'm good. I'm good. Um, I'm Leanne. I am the director, writer, and editor of the short film Myrtle Simpson, A Life on Ice. Um, and the film uh, is character driven and it's about the first woman to cross the polar ice cap of Greenland on foot. Um, she did it in 1965 and she really wasn't recognized. She did a, a many other expeditions and, and um, was an adventurer, a mountain climber, uh, but wasn't really recognized for her achievements until 2017 when she was awarded the Polar Medal from Queen Elizabeth. Um, over 50 years after she had been the first woman to cross Greenland on foot. Right. Um, and thanks for bringing Myrtle herself to us for the, for the uh, interview session that we did. That was a, um, that was a highlight for me. Um, She's quite a character. Yes. <laughs> She's also 90 years old. So, um, right. And still active, still skiing, still swimming, still hiking, still biking. Yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I have a couple of questions for the group, and I'm just going to kind of throw it out there and let any of you uh, jump on it if you care to, or I'll do what I do in my classroom, which is that if everybody sits staring at the thing at the screen, pretending like they don't want to be noticed, I'll just call <laughs> on somebody. <laughs> but um, but I have a feeling you'll probably be a little less shy about that than my college classroom. Um, so uh, I'm just curious. Uh, I, I have a feeling that a number of you um, took advantage of the opportunity to watch some of the other films in the festival. And I'm just, I just want to see, you know, no, you know, no shame if, you, if the answer is nope, didn't have any time to watch any of them or, you know, or you don't have to even say so, but, but I'm just curious if anybody had, has any particular thoughts on other filmmakers films that they saw this past week in our festival um, can be, you know, uh, things that you loved it, and you're welcome to say if it's, you know, if you, if you have constructive criticism too, but um, well, I'll, I'll, pipe, I'll pipe in on, on sure. two films that filmmakers are both here, Leanne's film and um, James's films. I was very struck in both case, cases of how creatively they built an entire story using archival material mm -hmm. and such um, my archival material that hadn't been seen by anyone else. Um, I also had archival material, but mine c tended to be stuff people had seen before. But in both these cases, that was so fresh and you just saw things, it was like being an eyewitness to history again, and, and such rich caches of material. I thought that was very impressive. So I'll just note those two films. It's a great well, I, wanted to, I wanted to mention, also, Dope is Deaf, which I was thinking the same thing yeah. about the uh, incredible uh, archival material that they were able to uh, find and, and how they used it, I thought, was, was another film that uh, I thought did a very effective uh, job with that. I will second, Chris is, all, second or third all of that. I, I, amazing use and amazing uh, resources for, in all of those films. Sorry, go ahead, uh, Brian, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was also just going to note that Chris's film for Ismet um, had great uh, family archival material. And I was, I was actually very surprised that it even existed considering, you know, the refugee experience. Yep. Yep. All right. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any thoughts on any other films that uh, maybe, or the filmmaker isn't here that you don't have to butter them up necessarily? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I liked uh, on uh, Myrtle. Simpson. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I, I found that a very strong female empowerment movie. I mean that this woman, no, nothing stopped her from her goal and I, it was very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I really liked some, yeah, Myrtle is, as James and I were talking about, Myrtle is quite a character and um, she's very forthcoming in what she thinks and and she's also this kind of strangely, um, not strange really, but she's a very optimistic person. So during our Q&A, when James naturally asked about climate change, Myrtle went to some of the more positive, uh, lesser known aspects of climate change that the Greenlanders are experiencing. Yeah. And I think it freaks people out because, you know, 
ultimately, climate change is bad. She doesn't want the ice to disappear. It means a lot to her. But she will say, you know, there's been a huge boom uh, in the economy of Greenland uh, because all of these resources that they couldn't develop before, now they can get, you know, things like that. You're like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's not, it's not incorrect. Um, but um, yeah, I really love Celestial. Uh, I was really I happy to have a chance to see that film and what an impressive young, young filmmaker. I, I wouldn't, I'm not going to call him an up and coming filmmaker because he's currently making his third film, I think. And he's a junior at Berkeley. Right. <laughs> so, but, um, um, uh, Edward and Sally, I, I, Edward and Patty, I am sorry that I missed your film because I'm the, I'm a current Soho resident and I live in an air building. I live, uh, and I've well, learned a little more about You'll learn a lot about Soho. <laughs> oh, well, we should, we should chat. I love, uh, I really love the topic. An air building is an artist in residence building. Oh. So um, they're designated, there's a handful of them designated in New York and also in Brooklyn, where mm -hmm. you can't live in the building, you can't buy an apartment in the building unless you're in the arts. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's quite, it's quite interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I really liked Keep uh, Stray Home a lot, um, to tell you the truth. I, I, I think the story of immigrants is just really, the way you did it was really well done. You kind of really felt for the family. I, I just, I just really liked the film. I also, I liked all the films that that everybody here. I fell in love with Shmushi. I mean, who wouldn't, right? The, the Walrus. I was kind of crying. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. My, my wife is so skeptical. Like, Shmushi's not going to make it. Um, and you know, so we were kind of having this. She wouldn't watch it, and I did because uh, she was she was afraid of what was going to happen to him. Uh, but I, I just liked, I liked the range of the films, um, and I liked the kind of way that they address social justice. Um, and uh, activism, right? Um, and I, I just appreciated the kind of depth. Uh, I also like the Soho story about, I didn't know how metal workers actually were. I've never seen metal working like that before. So I thought that was really interesting, right? Um, is that, am I right? Is that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's, 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 I've never seen people work with metal like that and kind of one, I wonder what happened to them after, after that. Cause they, you know, the story kind of ends and you don't know what happened to them. You know that they, that they moved out of the building and it was converted. But but what happened to those metal workers who were really unique craftsmen? Um, you know, I'm just, I have questions like that. Mm -hmm. you're I'd like to fan. add that. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to say that I I was in Brian's um, short block and I I loved Keep Sorry Home. I just wanted to tell you that you know you did a mm. wonderful job um, helping me like empathize with their situation. I felt very emotional mm. by the end of that film. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. really well done. Hmm. Thank you both. Um, so the other major question I think I have for the filmmakers is I'm just curious what you all thought. So obviously <clears throat> we're all well aware at this point of the, you know, sort of mountains that we all had to climb to make this work, um, in COVID times and, uh, virtually. And I think we mentioned it a bunch of times through the course of the week and it came up in the Q and A's, but there's obvious downsides to the fact that we can't all be in movie theaters and have you up on stage answering questions afterwards. Mm -hmm. But kind of weirdly, um, we, there were also, you know, sort of, so, uh, you know, a number of silver linings to doing this virtually. And I'm not just talking about our festival, obviously all film festivals and all films in general. I mean, the, the you know, the way that, well, I don't know how much the um, brick and mortar you know, theaters are thrilled about, you know, having to stream, make films uh, available by streaming the Coolidge Corner in Brookline, Massachusetts or whatever, you know, saying, well, we've got a film that you can't see anywhere else, but you have to stream it. I mean, I don't think that's mm -hmm. anybody's idea of a great solution, but for film festivals, I think there was, there were a number of silver linings. So I'm just wondering if anybody wants to talk about, your experience with us, you do not by any stretch of the imagination have to just say, well, it was fantastic and you guys are so welcoming. You can do that <laughs> often, but, but, you know, you know lessons, that is true. <laughs> lessons that we all learned collectively from doing this virtually for the first time, um, uh, both pro and con, love to hear them if anybody wants to throw anything out there. 
Well, I think it's comfortable to be in your own home and look at all mm -hmm. these films, you know, and talk mm -hmm. to all of you. It's very comfortable. I'm not spending money on travel, hotel, you know, any of that. And I'm getting that it's not the same experience, but, um, you know, it's a full experience in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I also for... agree. Go ahead, James. Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say for, for my film, since um, I had a lot of family and relatives of Ismet watching the film, a lot of them live still in Bosnia and some in Germany. And so yeah. I know that a lot of them were able to watch and right. join uh, the film festival that way. So that in that way, it was a silver lining. I think one thing that maybe I would have loved to have a bit more, and I know in person it would be different, is the audience experience. You know, it's... Mm. It's not the same knowing that like people watched your film and maybe you'll get text messages about it, but it would have been so nice to actually being able to like hear the audience react um, yeah. in the theater itself. Yeah, unquestionably. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's magic to watch, you know, like, so you toil away from these films for sometimes years and years and then you watch with an audience and they laugh at something and you're like, Oh my God, <laughs> I was hoping someone would find that funny, you know, and they all laugh together and there's, there's that communal experience. But, um, I wonder that if going forward, if festivals will kind of hopefully be a hybrid of the two. Um, because so my film, just from the topic, it's been a, it's been a pretty, uh, substantial hit on the adventure and outdoor film circuit. Uh, and apparently people have been clamoring for some kind of way to see these films virtually for quite some time. Um, and I mean, when we stream in these festivals, we streamed in a festival in London back in May that was over a weekend. It was Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and a little bit of Monday. And my film was streamed 30,000 times. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God, I mean... And we were supposed to go to London. It was supposed to be at the Royal Geographic Society. And like, I was like, I can't, there's, there's zero chance that 30,000 people were going to pack into the, <laughs> into the National right. Geogra Royal Geographic Society and see the film. So in terms of exposure, it has been an interesting experience. And I guess, I mean, we were in uncharted waters and it's, it's been a complete surprise. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, I think I think in that sense, it's kind of democratized film in a really interesting way. It's made it much more accessible to people who don't have the resources to go to festivals and participate in that sense, right? And I like the fact that it's opened it up to different audiences. I think from filmmakers, there's that pro and con where we lose the intimacy of showing a film that we've worked on for years to an audience and just talking to you personally over a beer or a cup of coffee or whatever. Um, I think that hopefully we'll be able to do that. Maybe this group can make a trip to, to Newburyport and, and have, yeah. a after, have, have, have an early film. afternoon. Make that happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know. I really <laughs> but kind I think... of miss, uh, miss an audience, the audience feedback. Uh, yeah. I'd love to see the film on a big screen and mm -hmm. yeah. just kind of feel how it plays. I mean, you know, I know how it plays to a small group of one yeah. or two, <laughs> but how does it play? How does it play in a theater? And that, that's something that I would uh, really uh, enjoy experiencing. Right. Well, to what Leanne just said, I think we are definitely, we, and I think probably most film festivals are already saying, I mean, w why wouldn't we continue with some, if, if we're able to go back to movie theaters after the first of the year or, you know, next spring or whatever it might be, um, why wouldn't we continue to keep the struck, you know, the, the platform in place um, um, to, to stream as well? So however that might look, the, a hybrid version you know, a, the best of both worlds sort of thing. Um, I think we're already thinking in those terms and I have a pretty strong feeling that most film festivals are thinking the same way, why not, right? So, you know, be able to have the in-person theatrical experience, but also be able to let some folks who are outside of the area who can't afford to make the trip or it's too, too far of a distance or whatever, um, enjoy the film too, somehow. Um, so, I mean, I think we're all, definitely thinking in those terms. Yeah, like, like what Netflix does with their movies. Right. They show it in the theater and then they have no, it right. uh, you know, right. streaming online. It's a similar kind of thing. Um, just to go back to something James just said a minute ago, the I was uh, intrigued by what you said about the uh, maybe the democratization of the process because mm -hmm. that strikes me as a parallel to 
what's been going on for the last 10 or 20 years in the documentary film, film world in general, which is the democratiz democratization of the, of the filmmaking process itself, right? Mm -hmm. So we, uh, you know, maybe 20 years ago, let's say, um, well, probably a little less, but people were, people have begun to, be, the, 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 the cost of production has gone way down and you can edit your own films mm -hmm. on your laptop and you can shoot, you know, theoretically you could shoot it on an iPhone and have mm -hmm. uh, you know, and make a short film with iPhone footage that you edit yourself. Right. So mm -hmm. you no longer need a full, full on crew or full on gear. And so the process has been democratized. And I think that's, it's no secret that that's a big reason why we've seen such a boom in documentaries in general and relevant t contemporary, you know, topical um, documentaries mm -hmm. in particular. Um, and uh, so it's interesting that now we're being forced to figure out how to apply that to the audience side too, right? To make, mm -hmm. to democratize mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the consumption process for the audience. Yeah, because it's, uh, that's the big, the problem is getting people's eyeballs <laughs> yeah. these days. And also there's been a proliferation of film festivals. So right. um, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of everything. And um, there's still 24 hours in every day and, uh, you know, so many pressures to watch all the time. Everything's available on screen. So, um, yeah, it's it's a challenge. I, I think this whole industry has not known what the heck is going to happen for the last 15 years. It's just like remains a kind of unknown future. You can't, I mean, the, it's just gone upside down and backwards. It's gone right. not backwards, forwards, but all around. Um, so it's it's an uncertain it's uncertain, it's exciting. It's also takes a lot of kind of nimbleness and creativity to keep your film to find. It's like what I'm, I mean, maybe all we're, we're all in this boat. We all need to find our niche audience, not the mass audience, because we, we probably won't have a mass audience. So we each have to work to find our niche audience. And that's where I'm concentrating. I think, um, Festivals are kind of the in-between. It's the film gets made, they get put into the festival, but the festival isn't going to keep them. The festival mm -hmm. cannot keep them. Right. They have to be let go and allowed to find their audiences in other places through other means. And usually the filmmaker needs to take control of that again. Like you couldn't have a festival that ran all our films all year. You'd have to just offer them up for this window so that after the window, we can go make some money or do something, you know, <laughs> whatever it is our goal is, to find the meaning of the film that we had in mind in the first place. Is it revenue? Is it the ability to make another film? Is it to change the world? Whatever it is. Right. So fest festivals aren't distributors. They're just windows that open right. up for a short that period. That's a great. That's a great point, and it's a great opportunity for me to say something that I wanted to make sure I said, which is that all the films in our festival for uh, people watching this either live now or uh, later archived. Um, we we do this every year, and we'll certainly do it. We'll certainly make you know sort of double our efforts to do it this year. But we want to stay in touch with all you filmmakers and keep tabs on exactly that. What Polly was just saying, um, when if and when you have some kind of distribution set up. Like um, for instance, um, uh, Jim uh, Cricky who made uh, Can You Hear Us Now, which is the Wisconsin film. Mm -hmm. They told us on Tuesday night, I think it was, um, that they had just decided, when we were talking to them a couple weeks ago about when the Q and A was gonna be and all of that, they were, they were still in the process of trying to decide how to distribute their film. And because their film in particular is so timely about the upcoming election, mm -hmm. um, they basically announced it on Tuesday night that they said they've decided they've entered an agreement with Amazon to uh, make it available on Amazon Prime next week. So right. a week after our festival. So that's the kind of thing that if all of you get any kind of distribution or other screenings or, you know, you get, you know, you get to show your film, you know, PBS picks up your film or whatever it might be um uh please let us know and we will let our viewers know so that maybe right. you know, anybody who saw it and and loved it will be able to then turn around to their friends and say 
okay, here's how you can see it now. You know, you can stream it through Netflix or Amazon, or you can see it on what, you know, um, whatever the case may be. We have a question from an audience member and she's not just any audience member. She's Annie Patterson, who's um, one of the two main uh, uh, subjects of, uh, of Polly's film. Um, and uh, it, it's a good question. She's, so this is for anybody, basically. Um, she wants to know, uh, can the filmmakers speak about the patience of taking more than five years to, to make a documentary? Now, <laughs> it didn't, I don't think it took each of you that, quite that long, but um, it can certainly take that long. Um, the and, patience of the subject. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> right. And, you know, even if it's just a year, it, a year seems like an awful long time when you're, when you're, you know, have your head buried in, the, uh, you know, in the editing program, um, you know, till four o'clock in the morning every night to try to get it done or whatever. Anybody want to talk about the patience that it takes to make a documentary? It's not, I don't think it's necessarily patience. I mean, you know, if you have a drive and a love of the subject matter that you're working on, you, you keep wanting to do it. It brings you, I mean, yeah, it's frustrating and all that, but it, 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 it's very exciting. I find mm -hmm. it exciting. What do you mm -hmm. think? I think you need a lot of patience. <laughs> <laughs> well, so well, Matt, 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 Matt is a writer. <laughs> Matt, Matt is a writer and Ed is, has been a TV editor um, for, for decades. So uh, <laughs> Patty, maybe it was maybe right, that's a, a little more, a little <laughs> fresher for you than, than it as was. A, as an editor, I think, uh, from from that standpoint, patience is definitely a virtue. Right, right. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, sorry, Leanne, I interrupted you. No, no, I just said that's why they make a good pair because like one yeah. <laughs> one has the patience and the other one has the enthusiasm. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have a I have a related question. So I think as a filmmaker, you're going to have that resolve and drive to keep you plowing through year after year. Um, but how do you keep how do you keep your protagonists, how do you keep the film's subjects engaged in what you're trying to make when you know that it's gonna take five plus years for them to even see anything? Well, in my case, like I went in, um, so our plan was always to make a short about Myrtle and then to expand the film into a feature film. So we're, we're working on that step, right? So I am, I'm doing both. I was, I was initially developing that relationship with her and then planning on it going, uh, going further. Um, you know, I tried to explain to her at the beginning that it was going to take a while. She had done, she, she's not unknown. She's just not very widely known kind of outside her immediate, her immediate circle. So she's had media attention and uh, news interviews. I mean, she's written 13 books. Um, she often is invited for lectures and to give talks in different locations. Um, but uh, I tried to explain to her that it was not going to be a fast process, that, that with, I wasn't going to go away and then a week later, like a news story, she was going to see this on the BBC. This was going to take a while. Yep. And um, I don't think she really understood until she was at the premiere at BAMP. I don't think it really, I don't think it really sunk in, like, what, what, how this was different from the other news pieces that she had done, and the other, she built this little short film with this outdoor company called Rab, and she was an ambassador for them for a while. So she didn't really, she didn't really quit, you know, completely understand. Um, she was terrified and also simultaneously unbelievably excited. Um, because you need to open your life up like that is just a strange experience. But um, we just keep, I really keep her involved in the process. Um, she loves seeing, since everything's gone virtual, she watches every single film at every single festival that's not geocached outside Scotland. If she can access it from the UK, she watches everything. Mm -hmm. oh. And she's like, she's like, I would, she's like, I'm checking out the competition. <laughs> um, yes. But I think you just have to, you have to keep, I try to keep her engaged in the, in the parts of the film that aren't so like exciting and novel as well as, you know, like, oh, you know, I want to set up another interview with you. And she's like, haven't you asked me everything? And I'm like, well, 
probably, but I kind of want to ask it in a different way and like yeah. more, yeah. more explaining the process to her. She's so curious that she wants to stay engaged. Lynn, do you want to talk about what you're doing next? Um, you mean the feature of Myrtle? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, so we all are, we are planning a feature version of the film where... You mean a doc or a, a doc. narrative? Yeah, okay. a doc. Although, I mean, you know, if I was somebody, it I'd come along, snap up, snap up life rights to Myrtle, <laughs> Myrtle's story. Um, uh, but she, um, we didn't have time to go into, uh, it was really hard to get the film down to 34 minutes. It was really difficult. Uh, at one point, my cut was feature length, but we didn't have all the elements that we needed to make a feature length film. So, um, so we're gonna be expanding the topic by both um, talking more about Myrtle. She grew up in India. She was a child of the Raj. Her father was a military officer. Um, she, um, she, they, they went on an expedition to Suriname at one point because of Hugh's work. He studied um, what's known as chronobiology, which is the exposure of sunlight to the body. He was a pathologist, um, or is still a pathologist, but he's of course now retired. But um, so mostly his research was in the Arctic or the Antarctic to see what a lack of sunlight would do to the human body. But then he decided to like go do a 180 and see what constant exposure to sunlight would do to stress levels of the body. So they literally went to um, Suriname uh, up a river to a tribe who had never seen outsiders and lived with them for four months, mm. like off the land, like hunting and gathering. <laughs> you know? um, and I mean, they did this in all their different expeditions. So um, there's a lot of fascinating stuff. And then we're going to also open up the topic about um, gender equity in adventure sport and um, women who are, you know, these elite athlete, people like Hillary Nelson, who are high altitude climbers, who are doing things like climbing Everest and um, in, the, in the Himalayas and going on expeditions to Antarctica and things like that. Felicity Aston, who's also a polar explorer. And then, and motherhood, how that ties into motherhood. Because um, there are actually some polar explorers who use Myrtle's books as kind of a guidebook for their career. Mm -hmm. Because nobody had been a mother and a, and a polar explorer before. Uh, and then we're also gonna talk about more about climate change and about how the Simpsons were witnessing that the, the, um, what we, you know, they were some of the first people to see the ice melting in the 60s and 70s as it started to happen. We're not sure exactly when it started to happen, but they were there in the 60s and 70s and we're seeing that. So talk about, um needing to keep your subject engaged. That's why I asked you to talk about, the, if you, you know, if you wanted to talk about the feature version, because Myrtle went through the whole process with you to make this half hour film. And now you're, you know, you're keeping her on a leash. You're, 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 you're now you got, now we're not even close to Don Myrtle. Now we're working on the feature version, right? So and nobody puts Myrtle in a corner. Yeah, no, no right. Exactly. So, um, you know, I, I'm thinking in terms, so obviously we did have a number of films this year that were um, so well based on archival material. So that's gen generally speaking, those films, are, you know, um, didn't need more than, you know, um, an hour or two of interviews with the, with the, with the contemporary figures who were, who were uh, up here to discuss the subject. But I'm thinking in terms of our feature films, um, uh, two films uh, that probably apply to this discussion would be Opeka, which is the film about the Argentine priest who goes to Madagascar and has lived most of his life there, um, creating, building communities in, in, in Madagascar. And so uh, Cam Cowan, the filmmaker of that film, had to get, uh, the, well, I know he had to get, we talked about it in the Q&A, he had to get uh, Father Pedro um, to agree to let him trail him and follow him around probably for a year or whatever and um uh and and uh um and then the walrus and the whistleblower which if any of you saw the q a for that one uh natalie the filmmaker natalie bebo and um um uh, phil demers the the uh walrus trainer uh, they've been friends since sort of grade school or childhood or whatever um, they grew up, uh, and then they were not 
in touch as adults for a while. And then Natalie, the filmmaker, realized that her old friend from school, Phil, was this guy who was, you know, popping up in the news around Niagara um, because of his protest against Marine Land. And she, she said to him, Let, like, let's make this film. And now they're like, if you saw the Q and A, they're like, Oh, you know, old friends who just, you know, they, they finish each other's sentences. They, you know, she knows him way too well, you know, like, <laughs> he, you know, he'd be the first to say that he was a, uh, you know, he's a handful. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, so they've spent a lot of time together, obviously, and continue to do so because he's, st he's still in the news for the protest of the, of the, of Marine land. Yeah. It does depend on the subject. I mean, I've seen brilliant films that were shot in one weekend yeah. because the whole narrative could unfold in three days. And I actually think if you can do a film like that, it's a really great idea because <laughs> it's so hard financially and spirit wise and, and, you know, it's just hard to follow events as they unfold in real time in documentary. That's what a lot of people end up doing. But, you know, it's not the only way to make a film. I think they always take a while to put together in the edit room. That always takes weeks, months, because there's so much of the story gets created there. But you can shoot a film in a short amount of time if you choose the topic in such a way and many of us just don't do that because we end up being interested in characters and, the, and what they do and they do things over time and the story's revealed over time. So um, it's, um, it's a hard thing to control. Uh, if you, if you ch depending on what you choose the subject matter to be, that will determine a lot of how unpredictable and long it will take you. Um, <clears throat> Yeah. We can't go to... with our heart. That's the thing. We go with what we care about and we don't think about stuff like that. <laughs> right. James, go ahead. Well, uh, the Art of Descent took about four years to finish. Um, and we had, you know, the first draft of the film I mentioned before was about six hours. And we got it down to an hour oh. and 45 minutes. But the first film, that's not my first film. The, first, the film I was trying to interview Václav Havel for is called The Peril of Descent. It's actually my first film. Uh, it's not done yet, but I've been interviewing people over 12 years or 15 years, the mm -hmm. same people. Um, and these are all people who fled from radical Islam or relig religious persecution or persecution from uh, authoritarian states. So I'm going back to France. I was supposed to be back in France this year and next year filming interviews with them that I've done over three different camera formats, you know, standard definition, high def, <laughs> now 4K. Um, and that's kind of like presenting it editing problem because I have two to three different levels of qualities of film I've been shooting with the same subjects over time but that's actually kind of this part of the story but those people have been very patient because <laughs> they're like we thought you're going to see this film like 10 years ago what are you doing and then I made another film and you know so but there I think it's also interesting because their position these are people who live in exile that's why I was interested in a lot of the other films because these are people in exile um, and their position in society has changed over the last, you know, over the last 15 years because they're basically people from Muslim majority states who live in ex exile in Western Europe and they're writers, artists, intellectuals. Um, and it's interesting to kind of see them over time, you know, uh, develop their professional careers, their interaction with their own literary audiences and things like that. And also my evolution of the subject has changed a lot in the last 15 years because, you know, when I was doing working on Islam as a scholar of Islam, a lot of people um, liked it. Then there came, you know, really serious critique of people who did work on so-called radical Islam. Uh, and now I think there's kind of a give and take about what this actually means and how it translates into political discourse today. So I think the, the issue for a lot of us who work on biogra you know, biographical kind of filmmaking is interesting because the, the subjects engage, I'm sure that all of us can deal with this, think about this differently, but our subjects change. They don't stay the same over 10 or 15 years. Um, and that just presents all kinds of really interesting ways of thinking about film and how film interacts with subjects. I think one thing that we all kind of benefit from is uh, the thing that I find magical about filmmaking, at least for me, is people talk to us with cameras in a way they don't talk to us with other, you know, with a tape recorder or even a notepad. There's a very different kind of chemical interaction with subjects that you can only get through film. And I find it kind of like fascinating, the kind of discursive 
things that happen in film or the kind of just the identities of individuals in film is different than other places. I also like the fact that they speak for themselves, which as a writer, I write books, uh, I really, really like. And that's one of the reasons I moved to film because they speak, it's their voice, it's, it's their face, it's their, oftentimes their home. Um, and I think it, there's an authenticity to filmmaking if we do it right and not speak for them. I, I just really like that element. And I think all of us kind of engage in that dialogue differently in, in our filmmaking. But I really like the dialogue between the filmmaker and the subject. And all the films that you that we're talking about here have all done that um, to the point where, you know, I fell in love with Shmushin. <laughs> right. you know, it's, di- it's the dialogue between the filmmaker and the the, the walrus, you know, um, yes. I, I, and also the, you know, just the, you know, uh, Demers is like his curious love affair with this, this, totally. this walrus. Right. Yeah. And it's really, you know, it's, it's kind of heart stringy, you know, that someone yeah. would be this committed to it. And I, I, I like how film can do that. Um, yeah. And that's part of the reason that, that I decided to make film instead of just write books. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I like some, there's something visceral, uh, and there's a sound and there's something different in film. And I think we all enjoy the wonder of filmmaking. Uh, and just to go back to your festival, I, what I really like is how you allow us to talk and to each other. Um, and, you know, going back to how you presented the films, I think you've done a great job. And it's it's just been nice to, to, to see you all and hear about your filmmaking. And I'm kind of curious, I can't wait to see how all these projects evolve and where you go next yeah. to. Yeah. Um, so. Well, again, um, we will make sure that we let everybody know, follow us on social media, um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep everybody updated on all of your films. Um, so just please do stay in touch with us and let us know. Um, I'm going to take the opportunity now. Um, I'd like to keep this to an hour so everybody can get back to, uh, you know, do, doing your Saturday things. Um, uh, I, I'm going to take the opportunity now to sort of drum roll, please. I'm going to do, I'm going to give, I'm going to give out the awards. I don't think I have an envelope handy. Um, but, uh, I am going to, uh, announce our judges award winners. So we've had uh, a rotating cast of characters, um, with some, uh, great, um, uh, expertise under their belts who have served as our judges over the years. And, um, they submitted their choices for the judges awards. Um, to us uh, yesterday, or I think it was yesterday, um, lost track of days this week, um, as we've all lost track of days all for the last six months. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and just uh, announce them. Um, so um, uh, I'm going to start with the with a couple of special jury awards. So these are not we had uh, we we uh, we have five categories um, of award winning films that we're um, honoring this year. And these two um, are special commendations from the jury, from the judges um, outside of those five categories. So one of the two special jury award winners goes to Dope as Death, uh, which is Mia Donovan, um, uh, the filmmaker Mia Donovan. So congratulations to Mia and to that film. Um, And the other special jury award winner um, oh, it's an all Canada special. Okay, so uh, the other special jury award winner is The Walrus and the Whistleblower, director Natalie Bebo. So uh, obviously neither of those uh, of uh, Mia or Natalie are with us right now, but congratulations to both of them. And um, be- I should have said this beforehand, but we I- I've said this a number of times this week, but I'm going to say it again. We were uh, over the moon about the quality of the films that we – uh, were able to show this year. Um, almost everyone submitted through the film freeway process to our festival. Um, hopefully that means that, you know, you, the word of mouth from, you know, you heard about our festival from some decent word of mouth. Um, we're, we, we were really happy. We were, you know, frankly nervous to know, to, you know, were, were our numbers of submissions, we usually get, well, we, I shouldn't say how many submissions we get, we get a significant number of submissions and usually show about 25 films. We showed 16 this year, six features, uh, nine shorts, um, and uh, cut back for obvious reasons. We wanted to make sure that the ones that we did stream uh, virtually were, we could devote all of our attention to. Um, and. Again, we weren't sure what the submissions were going to look like, whether the numbers were going to be down. 
and we were really thrilled with the quality of all the films that we ended up showing, selecting and showing in this festival. So congratulations to all of you. Um, but then I'm going to go ahead and, re and, uh, and announce the other <coughs> award winners. So the David Kleiler Cinephile Award is named for, we created this award a few years ago for a longtime friend of the festival, David Kleiler, who was sort of a, he was kind of Boston's um, most beloved um, film lover. Uh, he was one of our judges for, for pretty much the whole festival from the beginning um, each year. He came to everything. Um, David passed away last year, uh, last year or no, last year, yeah. And um, we did a nice uh, memorial service for, uh, at the festival um, for him. Um, his son is actually making a film about his dad and his uh, lifelong love of movies. So last year we named, we renamed one of our uh, uh, movie lover awards, essentially the David Kleiler cinephile award. And the winner of that this year goes to Dafa Metti, which is the short film about the Paris uh, street vendors by the um, British-based filmmaker Tal Amaran. Mm -hmm. And so congratulations, Tal, for, um, for, for winning the David Kleiler Cinephile Award. Um, that one means a lot to us for obvious reasons because of who it's named after. The best feature winner uh, for 2020 goes to Can Art Stop a Bullet? William Kelly's Big Picture which is the feature film about Bill Kelly, the Australian artist and his lifelong um, activism, peace act, his lifelong peace activism um, directed by Mark Street. Um, so congratulations to Mark and also to Bill, who we were uh, thrilled to have in our Q and A session um, a couple nights ago. And then uh, the last three winners um, I'm happy to say are all with us right now. So, uh, um, so if you have your uh, Oscar speeches ready, um, <laughs> or not, you do you know, no pressure. Um, the, our uh, let's see, our our best uh, our first time filmmaker award goes to James Lasour for uh, the Art of Descent, and um, I'm very happy that James made it clear when he started to say it's actually not my first film a few minutes ago you were talking about <laughs> the perils of descent i was like oh no <laughs> but then you made it but then obviously you made it clear which i should have realized that uh you know you, you haven't actually completed the perils of descent yet so the art of descent remains and will forever be your it, first is. Film. <laughs> it, it is my first film and thank you yeah so so congratulations we're uh, thrilled to uh that the judges selected your film um I, I, it's an honor and I'm, on behalf of the University of Nebraska and Czech TV, which the co-partners of the film, we're really honored and it's been a privilege to, to be with you. Um, and nobody thinks they're going to win an award. I don't think any, anybody who's seen the films thinks they're going to win anything. I mean, mm -hmm. if you do, I think you're not watching the films because the films are just extraordinary. Uh, but it, just to win a, an award, being a, being your festival is an honor in itself. And, to win an award, especially this one for me. Yeah, I'm an older guy, you know, an older filmmaker who's come late to the game. Most of you are much younger, you know, many of you are younger. Um, and I just, I, it's just, I'm, I'm loving this new experience of mm -hmm. being able to express myself in a different way. And I'm just honored and I love to be a first time filmmaker. It's cool. And you're right, this is my first film. <laughs> Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Uh, you are welcome, congratulations. Um, Thank you. This year's winner of our Best New England Film, which is something we do every year, um, goes to We Began to Sing uh, by Polly Wells, who's in Toronto right now. But the film is clearly about New England and New Englanders. So uh, uh, congratulations, Polly. And uh, you are welcome to say a few words if you'd like. And you're welcome <laughs> to decline if you'd like not to. <laughs> well, um, I'm thrilled. I mean, it's just wonderful to get um, at affirmation uh, after all the years of hard work, as we just mm. discussed. So, um, and I'm just, I had a, an amazing experience making the film with Annie and Peter and getting to meet Pete Seeger. And mm. I had a great team, my editor and my co-producer, they just, they're why it's a success as much as me. So Candy Peltiel and uh, Deborah Palloway. Uh, so uh, I'm thrilled. Thank you so much. Really. 
uh, just so everybody knows, I have an I have an orchestra waiting over here in my attic <laughs> office to play you off in case your acceptance speeches go too long. But so far that hasn't happened. So that's good. <laughs> and then our final um, <laughs> our final uh, uh, award to announce uh, goes to the this year's winner of the Newburyport Documentary Film Festival Best Short Film, and that goes to Brian Redondo's Keep Saray Home. Yay! Congratulations, Brian. Congratulations. Thank you, everybody. Um, and thank you to the festival for making all of this happen in these, you know, unforeseen circumstances. And I think it's been a wonderful festival. And it's a, it's a great honor uh, for the film to be recognized. Um, and I'm just glad that, you know, it took place at Newburyport, which is um, basically the backyard of, of the Boston mm -hmm. area. And, mm -hmm. and that's the home for all the, the people in the film. And I hope that uh, the recognition can help Saray's story and, and Hua's story and Victoria's story um, find a wider audience. Because, uh, uh, you know, this, this is a very real issue for all of them mm -hmm. and for all of us, um, mm -hmm. particularly this uh, presidential election season. So, yeah, um, no question. Well, we were pretty thrilled that your film um, and Chris's film were so local to us. I mean, we, we sort of have, um, uh, we, we tend to show a few films that are shot in, in or around this area, north of Boston or, or around Massachusetts or in New England each year, just based on the, na the nature of the submissions that we get. But your two films were um, uh, especially well paired um, and um, both really well told stories um, on a similar theme that is very important right now. So congratulations and um, happy to have you both here. Um, I am going to say a couple of quick thank yous, which I haven't really had the chance to do since we're wrapping up. And then I'll say thank you to you all. We'll be done in a couple minutes. Um, uh, so I just want to, you know, thank our sponsors. First and foremost, we've um, thanked them, um, but, but we want to take one more opportunity to do it again right now. The Institution for Savings, the Mass Cult Massachusetts Cultural Council, the Amesbury Cultural Council, um, and uh, the Paul SD Gallery. We also have a number of other sponsors um, who, uh, who, without them, we could not have uh, presented the, the, the festival just as we could not have presented any of the earlier festivals that we've done in person without the support of our sponsors. Um, so thanks to all of you, um, the ones, those that I named and those that I did not name, but you hopefully know who you are um, for supporting uh, the Documentary Film Festival. Um, I just want to thank personally our uh, volunteer, our, our all volunteer staff. Um, I'm not going to name everybody, but I am going to name uh, Joanne, Terry, Chris, Javon, uh, people uh, from our steering committee and from our board of directors who have done some fantastic work. There's Joanne. She's giving thumbs up. Thank you, Joanne. <laughs> um, many of us have put in, um, absurd hours uh, on a volunteer basis to make this festival happen year in and year out. And um, certainly this year, you know, in changing times, I'd like mm -hmm. to also thank Michelle Fino for founding the festival in the first place. Um, and everyone who's on our steering committee, everyone who's on our board of directors um, and our team of advocates we've tried to put in place in the last few years. I think it was Polly who was talking about finding your niche for your film. And as the promoters of the festival, we've tried to um, pair uh, what, we're, what we've called advocates with certain films to say, okay, beyond a general film festival audience here in Newburyport, or in this case online, how do we find the specific audience that needs to see this particular film for these reasons? And um, we have some tireless advocates who've helped us do that um, over the last several years, and we really appreciate their help. Um, we'd like to thank the ongoing support of the Screening Room and the Firehouse Center for the Arts, which are our two in-person venues, and uh, we can't wait until you can open your doors again, and uh, we'll see you soon. And um, I think that's about it. Joanne, do you want to say a couple words, or do you want to uh, tell me that I forgot to thank someone? You forgot to thank yourself, James. Thank you. For <laughs> he hasn't missed a, an interview yet. He's always there. Um, and Terry and Chris, behind the scenes, uh, great technical um, backup, you know, switching over to a whole new format. It was right. a learning experience. Yeah. 
-hmm. it's so gratifying when something comes off really well when you've worked so hard on it. So, um, and definitely the filmmakers, we couldn't do it without you. So we right. love having you and enjoying all your support. So um, I'm just going to say collectively, thanks to all of you for coming to the Filmmakers Roundtable. Next time I'll buy you a beer or a drink and it'll be at <laughs> later in the afternoon. So we won't feel guilty about having it. Um, let us know That's what no the problem with day are. drinking. I don't know. If you're, not, if you're not day drinking, you're not a documentary filmmaker. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, thanks to the audience for sticking with us and for uh, learning how to access a virtual film festival. Um, and thank you to all you filmmakers. Please do let us know, keep stay in touch with us. Let us know what your next projects are. Let us know, as I mentioned earlier, um, what's up next for the, for the current film that you showed, that you just showed with us this week so that we can let our um, supporters know. And um, happy filmmaking. And uh, we, uh, we, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank, thank you. you so much. So much. This is really it's great. Bye. 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 Congratulations to the winners.